Right. My name is Erin Medley, for those of you that do not know me, and I am the park manager at Red Flag. And uh, I want to thank Debbie, Laura, and the Tennessee Villagers Association for putting this on. I think this is great to have in our community. This is where I was born and raised, Cleveland, class of 95. So uh, I love being here at my hometown, working, and being involved with our community. Well, today I get to introduce a very important person. <laughs> Dr. Brett Riggs was, is, a distinguished Sequoia professor of Cherokee Studies at Western Carolina University in the Department of Anthropology and Sociology. He has worked extensively with the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians on many uh, archaeological and anthropological <laughs> uh, endeavors, <laughs> uh, mainly um, he is uh, known for his work at Dua, or Dua, however you say that. I think it said a couple of ways, right? Um, he has recently been recognized by the Cherokee Nation for his research um, that he conduct, conducted that was relevant to their history. <coughs> Brett um, has also come to Red Play and um, has taught me a lot about art. Um, one thing, I don't know if you guys know, but there was a battle at Red Clay, right, right? I thought that was kind of neat. Um, but it is my honor and it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Brett Reese. <laughs> Well, thank you, Aaron. Can everybody hear me without Mr. Microphone? No. Okay, we're back to Mr. Microphone now. And, uh, and I see so many familiar faces and friends in the room. This is like old home week. Um, I'll start out by um, saying, uh, Shio Nagata. That's, that's as far as my Cherokee goes, but it's like, hi, y'all. And um, what, what I'd like to do this afternoon, and, and I'll have to say I'm really glad to go after lunch so I don't have to be uh, follow right on the heels of Troy Wayne and Joe Guy, those two handsome doppelgangers, um, <laughs> and, and consummate storytellers. Um, so I'll do more of the Jack Webb, just the facts, ma'am, uh, kind of presentation here. What, I, what I'd like to share with you is some of our uh, recent work for the National Park Service, uh, undertaking a sort of a, a, to create an overview of the landscapes of the Fort Cass Immigration Depot. And my title uh, does state that, but I prefaced it with uh, Portal to the West, which seems pretty innocuous. You know, the idea that, okay, here's where everybody's staged to go to the West, but the deeper meaning of that is that the direction of the West was, was highly significant for Cherokee folks. The place where the sun goes to set, where day dies, where the dead go. It is a, a place where uh, chaos reigns, where bad things happen. It is moving away from the place of order and the place of harmony. It's moving into a world unknown. And this was the doorstep. That's what the Fort Cass Immigrating Depot was for the Cherokee people who were there through the summer of 1838. Um, this particular project is, is looking primarily at the physical landscape, the, the, uh, the features that were there at the time to understand how that built landscape existed and to see what of it survives, what of the archaeological record is there, how much of this landscape is still there and tangible and observable. Part of the uh, ultimate reason behind this project is to help inform interpretations uh, there in Charleston, Tennessee and, uh, and with the, uh, the Hiawassee River Heritage Center. So. So Fort Cass 
was set up on the sort of the eve of the removal as one of three immigration depots. The idea that all uh, Cherokee citizens would be gathered together, taken prisoner, those who had not voluntarily immigrated in the two years between the ratification of the treaty and uh, the end of May in 1838, that the military operations would swing into force and there were these depots where everyone would be collected together and ultimately uh, it was thought at the time sent off by boat down the river. And those were uh, uh, at Fort Cass in Ross's Landing and initially at Gunder's Landing. They later moved the depot to Fort Wayne, uh, or Fort Payne, excuse me. Oh, thank you. So Fort Cass has a very long history before that. There's a, a reason for that as one of, the, one of the depots. I mean, it's way up the Hiawassee River. It's not out on the main uh, Tennessee River Channel. It was the site of the Cherokee Agency. It was established there in 1820 after the session of the Hiawassee District when the old agency site had gone into the hands of or became McMahon County. And um, Colonel R.J. Meggs, the uh, federal agent to the Cherokees, selected this site across the river from um, um, Major John Walker's place at Walker's Ferry. So on the south side of this, this was a sort of a major nick point crossing place of the Hiawassee, and it was the doorway to the Cherokee Nation to the south. So that's the reason they established this agency here. Now through this time, uh, you know, from uh, those treaties of 1817 and 1819, gradually the sort of underlying mission of the agency has moved away from the earlier civilization plan and, and sort of facilitating U.S. Uh, Cherokee relationships to um, focus more and more and more on the idea of promoting immigration and removal of Cherokee people. We'll come back to the agency here in a minute. The agency is, make sure I don't, so here's Calhoun, which was established by Major John Walker, and there's the agency right across the river there, and you can see these major roads, this is an 1832 map, these major roads going south to Alabama, and then over to, uh, to Spring Place. Here's the area we'll talk about today, Charleston, Tennessee, let's see, you are somewhere right in here, right now. So you're not very far from the Immigration Depot, which began at the Hiawassee River and extended south to really the outskirts of, of Cleveland. We have this amazing map of that depot. This map was assembled, it's dated July 11th, 1838. This is our Rosetta Stone. This is the way we can understand something about the physical and cultural landscape of that depot at that very moment, the very moment of uh, uh, Cherokee removal and what ultimately becomes the, the sort of the stalling and incarceration of Cherokee citizens at this point. And we have this man to thank for that map, Henry Prince. You can see he was born in 1811, so he was 27 years old when he made that map. He was a lieutenant in the 4th Infantry, uh, had come in just a few days before and constructed this map. He was also one of the founding members of the U.S. Army Corps of Topographical Engineers, which, not coincidentally, formed on July 11, 1838. So this is, this is like, he turns this in as his homework, he gets his credentials. Why did they make this map? I think for us to understand anything about that landscape through the lens of this map, we have to understand why this was done. Because that tells us more about what's on the map and what's not on the map. You know, we read these maps as these very literal documents, as though they're all inclusive, as though it's an aerial photograph, and they're not. People make decisions about what to put on maps. And certainly Prince made decisions here. What had, had happened um, in June was there was a decision made to postpone the immigration, the forced immigration of Cherokee people until the fall of the year. 
There were thousands of people already gathered together. There were thousands of people here around uh, the agency in Fort Cass and in other depots and in other locations. They'd all been gathered together and now, suddenly, they weren't going to immigrate for months. The Army was not ready for this. No one was ready for this. They had made no preparation for people to stay in these places. General Winfield Scott, who was the commander of American forces and in charge of uh, the uh, deportation of Cherokee people, um, first suggested that they furlough everyone. Give everybody furloughs, let them go back home, settle their business. Makes perfect sense. Because Cherokee people were known for their very scrupulous honesty, they furloughed people who were under, under a capital sentences in the Cherokee Nation. If you killed someone, you were going to be executed, and you had five days, and they let you go away, let you go home to settle your affairs and say goodbye to everybody, knowing that you would come back for your execution. So it was, it was not unusual, this idea of furloughing these people, these thousands of prisoners, and allow them to settle their businesses before the fall. The state of Georgia didn't see it that way. The state of Georgia responded that they would shoot or hang any Cherokee found on their soil. And so, we'll get back to the state of Georgia. I know we've heard a lot about Georgia before. I'm sorry to all of you who are from Georgia now, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crack on Georgia a little bit, a little bit later. But because of that, Winfield Scott says, okay, we have to prepare to keep everybody here. And as part of that, we are obliged by the treaty to feed everyone, to provide rations, and in this situation also to, to provide what little comfort we can in this situation. So we have at that point in time thousands of people and thousands more arriving, coming in. It's a fairly chaotic scene with no, no provision made for folks. It's not as though there were shelters set up. There weren't even tents around. They had to be bringing stuff in from Fort Payne and everywhere else to try to find shelter for folks in what turned out to be one of the most brutal summers of the 19th century. They posted temperatures of 105 degrees at the agency and it quit raining. Even though it had been a very wet spring, it just quit raining. And so surface water was hard to find. Everybody had trouble finding surface water. I think, I have not found the orders, but I think Prince, who also got detached to the Indian Department, that is, the folks who were from the government overseeing the removal, that this is a map to provide for those prisoners in the various camps. Because what we see in this key is the locations of U.S. troops, the forts, and then the Cherokee camps, these little hatchers here, are all the locations of Cherokee prisoners encamped across this area, this expansive area, miles in extent, camped in discrete camps all across there to know where to take rations. And when we talk about rations at the time, we're talking about bacon, cornmeal, flour, and some coffee, a little bit of sugar, and beans, not much else. Where to, how to distribute rations, and how many rations to distribute. After spending way too many hours staring at this map, um, I think that each of these hatchers doesn't, have, you know, you look at it and you say, oh, that's a, that's a tent, and that's a tent, and that's a tent. I don't think that's what they are at all. What they're telling us is each one of those hatchers tells you how many rations need to be delivered to that location or how many rations need to be drawn by people from that location so they can, can distribute these materials. Also, this map with us showing the infrastructure, showing the roads, etc., is to show um, the doctors who are um, appointed to take care of each of these encampments where to go, how they should get to these places because nobody knew. And we find that these encampments were shifting around all the time. People were moving from one encampment to another. Um, some people moved all the way up from Ross's Landing to, to join these encampments. So imagine this. It's a chaotic scene. 
in the broiling heat out in the open and thousands of people piling in here. The detail of this map is incredible. Um, you know, here you see the river crossing at Calhoun and what I think is the other river crossing at Calhoun. The little uh, hamlet, uh, what's now Charleston, this is the agency here, this is the Fort Cass area. They even show all the topographic features. Prince had been trained at West Point. Everybody who graduated from West Point had a degree in civil engineering. They made maps, that's what they did. And so this, this is almost like his final exam here. And we, we see the hatcher. So, I mean, that's the way they depict it. That's a hilltop. That's a hilltop. That's a hilltop. There's a stream in a low place. And you can see they also show not only these things, but they show the things that were already on that land. Like, here's a field. That's a rail fence. You know how rail fences are all zigzaggy? That's a rail fence around the field and a house at the edge of it. So it has great detail. It has incredible detail. But it doesn't have precision. You can't take this map and stretch it out over the modern map. It just it doesn't work that way. It won't fit. It's warped in so many different ways. And despite all the detail that's on it, there are things we know were there that don't show up on this map. So all we can do at this point is we look at this and we try to understand what's depicted here and then we use that as our key to try to find what's depicted here. For instance, this is approximately Walker Valley Road. Well, this, yeah, approximately. And then here are these whole series of camps along here. You can see an aerial of that same landscape today. And there is, there is a resemblance, a pretty good resemblance there. Let me move you over into the LiDAR imagery. Who's familiar with LiDAR? It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool stuff. You know, uh, in the night while we were asleep, there were planes flying over, shooting laser beams down to the earth everywhere, collecting millions and millions and millions of data points to create these distance-based images that are far more detailed than anything that we can construct from aerial photographs or anything else. And they show us, for instance, there's the um, East Fork of South Mouse Creek through there, and they show us this part of Walker Valley just shown right in here, like that. And what they show here on the LIDAR that you can't see on maps, you can't even see it in the field, really. That road doesn't cross over here. That road crossed over here. And it followed that little ridge right around there like that. So what we see when we, when we go to sources like that and when we see these things on the ground is the road system doesn't translate directly. It's a ghost image of what was there in 1838. They follow basically the same routes and I lived in East Tennessee long enough to know that you can put a road here and you might move it over a few feet or a hundred feet, but you can't run it somewhere else, and that's what these roads have done. They followed the same corridors through time, but they're not necessarily the same roads. So if we look at the Fort Cass Immigrating Depot, this map, we can begin to understand that landscape as having a number of different components that we can pull apart. It's actually multiple landscapes, multiple cultural landscapes that overlap in space and time. There are military establishments starting in 1834. They're brought to the U.S. Cherokee Agency. That created its own landscape. It is a governmental landscape, but it's not military in nature. There are Cherokee civilian occupations, both domestic and commercial occupations there. Folks, you know, we tend to look at this map and we see the immigration camps and we see the forts, but they're also showing people's houses and fields, showing that this was, this was an occupied place and an occupied landscape. And there were Anglo-American civilian occupations, both domestic and commercial there, that are depicted on this map. Now, I don't know that we can sort them out, 
from the Cherokee civilian occupations because what happened is there were purchasers who moved in uh, after, uh, some after 1834 and some after 1836 and moved on to Cherokee farms and into Cherokee houses there. And there's the civilian infrastructure, which includes ferries and roads and mills. So all these things depicted on this map. This is, um, you know, highly, uh, and it would appear to be a complete image of that area in 1838. But I would argue that it's not. Let me back up a little bit and, and tell you something about, and I'll make all those go away, tell you something about the scope of this map. Why it depicts the area it does. So you can see this is line right here is actually defining a boundary. That's supposed to be the boundary of the immigration depot. Now they haven't, he didn't fill this in. I guess he had to turn it in before he could fill that in. <laughs> the immigration depot was, you know, we kind of had this idea that the military had set all this up and then they're going to move everybody out. And it's all really well planned. Well, it didn't work that way. So everybody's piling in there in June, and they're like, oh, we gotta open up some land for folks to camp on. And so they first define a depot that runs from Rattlesnake Spring up like that. So there would have been a dividing line right there, okay? And that was defined on June the 9th by order. This is the July expansion. And that's one of the things that Prince was doing, is to show the extent of the expansion of the depot in July. We know from other accounts that by the end of July, there were people camping over here on Chestuy Creek. So the camps move all the way out there, and they're moving all the way down through this area. Um, Prince is very careful. See, this is, this is a blank country in here, is what he's showing. He's showing where one road goes through, but he shows the springs. He shows the major springs. That's because that's where people are going to need to camp. As surface water is disappearing, they have to get to these large limestone springs, you know, where they're pulling up from these deep aquifers to be able to situate themselves in a, in a place where water is going to be dependable. Water is everything. The reason the immigration was delayed until the beginning of September initially was there was no water. There was a drought that was gripping uh, at least the eastern third of the United States. And so overland travel, I mean boat travel was impractical. I mean, we didn't have TVA at the time to keep water levels up and over everything. You had shoals, you had everything else. And no matter how shallow draft your boats were, there arrived a time you could not run boats down the river, dependably. If you tried to move overland, you can't do that if your water sources are 15 miles apart. You just can't. And the other thing that happens, um, there was a disease that was introduced into the United States in 1832. 1832, it's called cholera. And anybody who tried to move overland in the heat and drought in the summer were subject to that. It wiped out, you know, whole wagon trains on the Oregon Trail. And Cherokee folks were acutely aware of this. The petition to Winfield Scott for the delay of the immigration was because they did not want to arrive in the Arkansas, as they called it, in the sickly season because an earlier immigration in 1834 had been wiped out by cholera. Folks really had this foreboding that they were going to the land of death, to the, the deaths in the West. So trying to find dependable springs and clean water for people to use through this summer period was critical. There was already waterborne disease ravaging Knoxville, Tennessee, just 60 miles away because of this drought at the time. Okay, I gotta go all the way through those again to get to our next slide. When we look at the Cherokee occupations, this was very much a Cherokee place. And there's whole groups, and I have to thank Debbie Moore for her transcriptions of the Cherokee property valuations in Tennessee. 
which I scanned and did OCR with and then edited this down. So I cribbed uh, uh, shamelessly here. Um, we can, I think, confidently assert that at least this group of Cherokee folks resided on that, on that reserve, on the um, Immigration Depot Reserve. There were other folks who were all up Chittata Creek, um, but because the uh, property valuations don't give us their locations, I, I don't feel confident in asserting their occupancy, their residence within this. Prince showed some of the houses along the roads and selected houses. We know there were all these folks living on Chittata Creek and their houses don't show up on that map. So he's very selective of what he shows and what he doesn't. But you can see there's folks out in Walker Valley. That is uh, the widow Walker. That's Major John Walker's uh, widow, uh, Elizabeth Lowry. Um, she operated as a, a sort of a stand or lodging house out there because Army officers took residence in her place. It's close enough to the agency and to forecast that they could do that and ride to work. So I would assert that uh, they're out there pretty close. Um, Blackbird, is it the standing turkey? Theft, that's one of the greatest names ever. <laughs> Tobacco John and Lewis Ross. And it's arguable that that whole complex there around Charleston was more about Lewis Ross than it was about anything else. He was the wealthiest man in the, in the Cherokee Nation, maybe the wealthiest man in East Tennessee at the time. I'm not quite sure about that, but there's so many authorities here, I don't want to assert that. But, uh, um, but someone who was very prominent in Cherokee politics, he was the, sort of the bursar behind the Cherokee Nation. Uh, his brother John was principal chief. He had the largest property valuation of Yeah, and several combined. So here's here's uh, Lewis there, and uh, you know this is this is just the front end of this valuation. Is the on the map? No, it's it's off the map. Um, there are a lot of things that weren't put on the map. Um, because the map is created for a specific purpose. There is, we could say, an agenda or a specific purpose involved. And the things that, that are pertinent to that purpose show up on the map, and then other things don't. So this is a highly detailed schematic. So you can see Lewis Ross had just, ex this, this is just the first couple paragraphs of his holdings, which went on for pages and pages and pages. Uh, you know, when this guy had a house worth $3,500, most folks' houses were valued at $35. So he's definitely the 1% there. But inarguably, inarguably, a Cherokee patriot. And the story of Lewis Ross is a fascinating story. I won't recount much of it here, but he was um, um, the agent, the superintendent for removal, had identified him as public enemy number one. He was like the main man that was foiling all the machinations of the U.S. government to get the Cherokees out of there. So he tried his best to get Lewis Ross thrown off of what he asserted was the agency reserve. Lewis Ross had actually come there, moved there, when R.J. Miggs did. Miggs invited him to come in and put his store back up because he had a store at the old agency. Miggs liked to buy his coffee next door. You know, he'd go into the Lewis Ross Starbucks and have his coffee in the morning and he didn't, you know, he didn't want to miss that. And so he had actually brought Lewis Ross there. And Lewis had prospered considerably from his position at this critical point in the Cherokee Nation. You can see this is an old photograph of uh, was Barrett's Hotel, um, and uh, that you know is supposedly the Lewis Ross House before the Lewis Ross House that we all know and now that's repainted love now. Um, and you can see the description of this is a huge log dwelling that's weatherboarded, so that explains why it's got the clabbered on it. Two brick chimneys, four fireplaces, and that fits. 11 by 16 light windows, and you can see all the windows. 
all painted and finished in a workmanlike manner, and a yard lot well enclosed with paling. Of course, this is uh, as it almost currently looks now. It's considerably modified. It may even have been uh, partially destroyed and rebuilt at one time. Um, and its location there at uh, uh, 373 Market Street. Here is a map that the agent submitted that B.F. Curry, who was the superintendent of removal, submitted with his petition to have Lewis Ross removed, to have him thrown out of there. There's a couple of reasons. One, he says he's corrupting every federal agent who comes here. So all of the Army officers would stay with him and Lewis Ross would just hang out with him and talk with him about the Cherokee cause. And the other reason is because Curry wanted that house. Curry wanted the brick store. Curry wanted everything. B.F. Curry, we could do a whole session on him, was the uh, superintendent of immigration who was uh, stationed there at the agency in 1831 to promote Jackson's policies. He was described by his contemporaries as base, vile, corrupt. Nobody says a fine, honorable man. Everybody, everybody talked about this guy this way. And so he, sees, he places himself in direct opposition to Ross. And then here is Prince's map showing that same area. That's the agency branch. So the agency's on this side and Ross is on this side. Maybe. So here's our LIDAR image. There's the Lewis Ross house. Now, if we look at this, is that the Lewis Ross house shown there? All these officers were staying at Lewis Ross's. It was, it was like the center place. It was the happening place around the agency. So you would think Prince would show Lewis Ross's house. And that's approximately right. And you know, this, this uh, sort of larger building with, with outbuildings with it. Now it's in direct proximity to the, uh, to the whole military establishment. Why do I throw up my question marks? Look which side of the street it's on. But I would submit to you this is my heresy, one of my heresies for today. That at that time, the street did, in fact, run back here, right along that side. And the facade of the Lewis Ross house was flipped. We've seen it happen over and over and over again. Road runs on the other side, they flip the front door, becomes the back door, and the back door becomes the front door. So. We'll go out and find out about that. There are lots of other Cherokee properties out there, like this belonging to Tobacco John. And Tobacco John, we know he, he, he said, I'm a full-blood Cherokee. I live near the agency in the old nation. Um, the Cherokees were encamped all about my place, as there were a great many in the time they were kept there. And this is also the soldiers were camped close by. So we know that one of those encampments that shows up on Prince's map is talking about this, uh, this place. And the soldiers killed all his chickens. And the Cherokees ate all of his corn. But he says he looks to the U.S. government for compensation as the Cherokees did not come there of their own accord. Now close to Tobacco John, in fact, this guy was the son-in-law of Tobacco John, was Blackbird. And he filed a similar claim. He said that um, even though he lived near the encampments, he was forced to leave his house and go into the camps. He was told by the soldiers if he didn't leave and go into the camps, they'd take me into the fort and keep me there. He said because he moved into the camps, he lost all of his corn, and then it continues to say and all the other vegetables he had growing. To the people who were desperately hungry for something other than salt pork and, and uh, flour, fat back. Now, I think we can actually figure out where Blackbird lived, and on that basis we can figure out where Tobacco John was, and we can start putting together that Cherokee landscape that existed in the Fort Cass Reserve. So,
for instance, if we look out about a mile from the agency, you, you know, you can go all the way around, there's this house down here. There's a field and there's a house. If we look at the 1899 navigation map for the Hiawassee River, it shows right down in that same area, if you go down from Charleston, the Blackbird Shoals, named for Blackbird. So I think we can assert that Blackbird's house was right there. And from that, we know that Tobacco John lived a quarter mile away. So we can begin to find out these relationships among and between households, both spatially and then the way these households interacted. This is a uh, quote, uh, an unpublished as of yet journalist, I think it's uh, uh, going into publication from, from Wiley Lowry, who came into the agency reserve uh, on June 30th of 1838. So he gives us this brand new view, these new eyes on what was going on in the agency. He said, went down and crossed the Hiawassee River, paid 25 cents. Probably paid that to Hiram Turk, who was over on the Calhoun side of the river. Got into what's called the agency as soon as I crossed. This is a considerable place of Indians. The houses are all cabins. And he's talking about, he's looking at these buildings. There's 17 stores here, some tailors, silversmiths, and blacksmiths. The steamboats in high water can run up to this place, but the water is low now, and they cannot come up. There's several low boats lying on the shore of this place. So they're landlocked at this point. What Lowry came in and saw, and the reason Lowry came there, was that that date in 1838, and especially by the end of the next month, this was the largest city in Tennessee. It had 3,000 more people than Nashville. This was the high point, I guess, until the Civil War, and then there's a whole other army there. So he's seeing this, this bustling, busy place, and why are there all these stores there? These stores are there because Cherokee people, Cherokee prisoners being brought into that place, um, are receiving pay for their property valuations. Under the terms of the treaty, they were paid for their improvements to property. So paid for cabins, paid for fields, not for the land, but for the field and the fences that enclosed it. And some of these were hundreds of dollars, some were thousands of dollars. Some were tens of thousands of dollars for people like Lewis Ross. So you received money there at this board. There were commissioners to hand this out. You received hard cash, cash money. And I had to go back and read my U.S. history, but that time in 1838 was the, the opening of the first American Great Depression. There was no cash anywhere. You couldn't get cash money. All transactions were done with IOUs, you know. Um, just little letters of commitment. I'll pay you when there's cash. But these folks have cash. And so every merchant from states around come pouring into that area to try to sell things to the Cherokees. There's one who's quoting, he said, the Indians now have their money and I shall take it from them. And that's why Wiley was there. But he came rolling in with his cartload of goods and he's like, well, everybody got here first. I think I'll keep moving. So that's sort of the environment that was going on there. It was, it was, a, it was a Wild West type environment. You know, just there were uh, con men there, card sharks, bootleggers, everybody trying to get in on the action and take the money take the last dregs of what the Cherokee people had away from them. And so this was, um, it was wide open at the time. I'm going to back up a little bit. There's that agency landscape. and We won't talk too much about that. But the agency reserve along this side of Agency Creek, and these houses right here can be as associated with the agency that grew and developed from 1820 through 1835. Now, as they moved into the uh, treaty negotiations that resulted in the uh, uh, New Echota Treaty, the 
federal agent to the Cherokees was dismissed, basically. They, did, they weren't going to need him anymore, right? Hugh Montgomery gets to pack up his stuff. He has, uh, he has houses and outbuildings there. Curry has houses and outbuildings. There's a sub-agent with houses and outbuildings. And they all cultivate fields. They're all allowed to cultivate fields within the Cherokee Nation. They've brought in tenants. Uh, Montgomery has brought in his, well, first Miggs brought in a guy named Cowan to run another store there. Uh, Montgomery brings in his, his son-in-law and then they're trying to throw his son-in-law out. The Cherokees are trying to get rid of these folks, Cowan and, and uh, Hardwick and these folks, constantly. And uh, then, of course, Curry installs his people. You know, this is just like the epicenter of graft and corruption going on here. Um, and this, this is what led to all the government regulations that everybody howls about all the time, is all the, the double dealing that B.F. Curry was doing as part of the Jackson administration. And that's why he was trying to get rid of Ross. He didn't want these army officers there at Ross's because they're reporting back to Washington, D.C., everything that he's trying to pull. He was indeed one of the most hated men in the Cherokee Nation, certainly. Um, and, and we'll talk about that in a minute. He had, he had pulled scams through 1834, getting people's properties flipped over and rolling them for immigration when they didn't know anything about it. Um, had stolen many, many thousands. There around the agency grew Fort Cass. And I'm, I'm so glad um, Sheriff Joe Guy gave us our, our backstory on Jack Walker and, and then everything that Troy Wayne said because it relates directly to that. Look at that first date, September 1, 1834. Jack Walker gets shot and B.F. Curry panics because he knows he's next. Everybody out there is after Curry. He is terrified that they're going to rise up, that there's going to be a general uprising in the Cherokee Nation. In fact, he's also terrified of Major John Walker, who foiled in his attempts to assassinate John Ross decided that B.F. Curry was as much to blame as John Ross was and went and was sighted for several nights out in the bushes skulking with a rifle, they said, even though he had not been seen with a rifle for years, trying to get a shot at B.F. Curry and finally settles for going into Curry's stable and stabbing his horse in the side with a dirt knife. Yeah. Just as a little warning to him. So Curry is, is terrified for his life. And he calls in a company from Fort, Cat, from Fort Armistead, which is up in Coker Creek, to come in, really, as his bodyguard. And then he requests that they be stationed there permanently. And we see, and these guys were, they were tickled to come down out of Coker Creek because, you know, we still don't have cell phone coverage there today. I mean, it, it's just like, the, the, the guy who, who was ultimately put in charge, who was, who was in command at Coker Creek and ultimately put in charge at, at Camp Cass and then Fort Cass, Chileab Smith Howe, wrote to his soon-to-be wife that, you know, here I am stationed, I'm looking out my window at the Great Ridge that separates North Carolina and Tennessee, and I was soon be chained in the icy depths of hell. And so, so these guys were pretty glad to come down here, you know, um, and, and move in. And so you can see that they are, they say they're quite comfortable. They found buildings attached to the agency. So the first thing they did is they moved into agency buildings. And then they gradually built this facility after Curry requested that it be made a permanent station. So by 1834, there were men in quarters that were comfortable for the winter but only the enlisted men. There wasn't enough room for the officers who needed to be, for whatever reason, segregated from the enlisted men, so they all boarded with Lewis Ross. They all stayed with Lewis Ross the whole time. Lewis Ross has his finger on everything that's going on in the U.S. government through this medium. Eighteen thirty-six, after the treaty, is ratified. Then preparations begin in earnest for what everyone anticipates in, in the federal government as being the forced deportation, forcible deportation of the Cherokee Nation. So they bring in General John Ellis Wool. 
and um, they put him in charge of a command that's really not even there. He ends up raising uh, East Tennessee uh, volunteers. They have Camp Wall in Athens, for instance, where those guys come in. Um, and he has C.S. Howe really kind of running. It became Fort Cass. It went from being Camp Cass to Fort Cass in, the, in, the 18, in 1835. So he directs then uh, Howe at the, in November to build new quarters apart from the agency, so across Agency Creek, near the ordnance store where they're keeping ammunition, and also a substantial log magazine sufficiently large to contain all the ammunition which may be deposited at the post. The whole, including the ordnance store, to be surrounded by a single row of pickets 12 feet high above the ground with substantial blockhouses at the opposite angles. This is the fortification. This is the order to construct that. Uh, Hal, you know, Hal had, a, you know, he, he was a very responsible officer, but occasionally saying, I can't do that, I've got a bone in my leg. You know, so it took him a little while, it took months to actually carry these orders uh, into fruition, but these fortifications, sort of like these illustrated in Florida from the same time, this drawing, by the way, is by Henry Prince, who made our map uh, in Florida, of these uh, uh, enclosures with blockhouses on opposing corners. Like Fort Gardner there. And if we look at Prince's map, this is Fort Cass. Okay, it's shown way up here near the river. This is his symbol that he designated. This is the location. Note right here in his hatchers, there's this big dark divot right there on the riverbank. And I don't know yet if that's a sinkhole that got cut into or if it's a riverbank collapse or what. But they built right on the brink of that because they wanted a place that you couldn't assault it from the river face. That feature's still there. That's it right there. That's exactly what you're looking at is this big notch right here. And there's where it is in the modern community. Has not been wiped out by the railroad. You know, and I would suggest, although we haven't looked for it yet, there is still archaeological evidence of that, and that will be one of our targets in our study. Same can be said for Fort Foster. It was built October 6th. We found all the, all the records, everybody who worked on it. Uh, to put Fort Foster together, completed October 6, 1837, down here at Rattlesnake Springs. When Lowry travels south from the agency, he said there are thousands of Indians at the agency, their camps are thick for several miles around. There's said to be the rise of 10,000 Indians about here. I stayed about two and a half hours, looked at the Indians' houses, and went on the road toward Cleveland, saw a good many camps on the road. There probably weren't 10,000 people there on June 30th, but it was, it was moving forward. We see uh, counts coming from uh, the Army at that time of about 7,000 people, but that's ever increasing the whole time. And if you're riding through, 7,000 and 10,000 is the same. So Prince's map shows a whole series of encampments. What we have to remember is this is a snapshot. This is a snapshot as of July 11th, 1838. It was not like this before, and it was not like this after. Because they grew into this configuration, and then they fissioned, and they spread out and there are more camps and more camps and more camps. But here's a, just a, a, a list of the camps that show up in the various records. So there's an encampment to the west of the agency. I'll show you where these are. An encampment to the west of the agency. An encampment adjoining town. Bedwell Springs. Anybody know where Bedwell Springs is? Please come tell me afterwards. The only Bedwell that I can find anywhere around had this land right here. And that man is buried out at, on Tasso Road, 
Uh, Chittaden. The ridge encampment southeast of the agency, and they're talking about this. So I think this is what they're talking about is Chittada because it's near the mouth of Chittada Creek. Chistui Creek, which is over here, he doesn't show, Prince doesn't show anything on Chistui Creek, but we know that people encamp there along Chistui. Um, and then the middle encampment on the east branch of Mouse Creek, um, and that should say the southern encampment instead of the middle. I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how they're parsing these out. Um, but then uh, Dr. Lyde wrote, the encampments are becoming very much scattered and expanded. Now in an earlier iteration, I'll, I'll come to that. There's something I saw on this map that I'd ignored for years. There's a little symbol up here. And the key wasn't up here, it's actually down in that corner and I cut it away so I could carry the map around and read it, you know, and so I, I didn't look at this. Right there, those two little bars, he says Cherokee cantonment. A cantonment is like a long-term encampment with improvements, with buildings, okay? And we see that William Foster, toward the end of June, writes, within the past two days I've carefully inspected all the camps. They're healthy in a very tolerable state of cleanliness the old immigrating camp alone being accepted. This requires attention. So apparently this was a nasty place. This was, this was a place that were actually structures that were set up for Cherokee immigrants. And they'd been set up by B.F. Curry in 1832 when he said there's between three and 400 immigrants here, others coming in daily. It's necessary to have cheap buildings erected to shelter the first who arrive from the inclemency of the weather. Also the others are collecting. That's when this is established, this cantonment. It's also the scene of, and I'm, I'm, I gotta pull out my Troy Wayne card now to tell this story. Um, it's the scene of a confrontation over state sovereignty. Curry has this whole group of immigrants down there on the river. Now you notice he doesn't have these folks at the agency because he's scared of them. He's scared of these folks doesn't have them up close. He's got them down river there. And Curry has brought in the Georgia Guard. He brought the Georgia Guard to the agency to guard these camps. Now you've already heard about the Georgia Guard. You know, it's, it's like a bad biker gang or something. And he's got these guys in here. And when word gets out and gets up to Athens, Tennessee, Colonel Archibald Turk raises the McMinn County Militia and comes over and crosses the river and as the account says, he presented his cocked pistol at the breast of the captain of the Georgia Guard and ordered them politely to get the hell out of the chartered bounds of Tennessee and threw them out. So we, you know, a small victory for, for Colonel Turk there. But that happened right there at that place down on the Hiawassee. So that's an occupied camp. When folks are coming into these camps, as I said, this is a, a, a population of people who are already sick. They're already, there had been famine in the Cherokee Nation, actually famine across much of the southeast in 1836. And that had weakened everybody. There's a lot of illness going around. As they begin rounding up folks in the Cherokee Nation, there's an epidemic of whooping cough going on. So as they bring people in, they're already sick. And you pile people together in these camps and that sickness just spreads. So you've got doctors going to these camps trying to doctor people with mercury and crazy stuff like that. Bleed them with leeches, give them some mercury and see if they'll die. And so there's just misery in these places. And the mortality is shocking, absolutely shocking. So we have doctor's reports talking about for this month, there were 60 people in this camp dead, there were 50 in this camp dead. We have reports from the agency from uh, Reverend Daniel Buttrick. He had heard that 10 to 20 people were dying a day at the agency out of a population of less than 10,000 people. So let's look at one of these camps here. So these are, these are the main camps of folks from North Carolina along the East Fork 
Little Mouse Creek or South Mouse Creek. In the earliest version, uh, when they refer to these camps, they talk about them as the camp at Spriggs and the camp at Mrs. Walker's. They never say that they're on South Mouse Creek. He just said the camp's at Spriggs and the camp's at, Ze at uh, Mrs. Walker's. Well, Ezekiel Spriggs took this plot of land here later in 1838 as occupant. This is Spriggs' place. This is the camp they're talking about at Spriggs's. And we know that because if you go out there in that field, there's the Spriggs Cemetery, right in that spot. And so I wonder if this is not Mrs. Walker's place, old, old Major John Walker's farm, up there on Walker Valley Road. Now we attempted to do some field work here, but as it turned out, these camps scattered all along here. But by the way, notice that this, this creek has been channelized extensively moved around, the road was moved around, um, but it turned out this is all in a very highly productive hay field. Archaeologists like to dig holes, that, that just wasn't going to wash out there. So we moved on from that point, and, and this is a major focus of our effort for the Park Service, is trying to locate first and foremost the encampments where Cherokee citizens spent the summer of 1837, or 1838 there, because that's really the central story of this place. So we moved on, we went to the Ridge encampments. Now, I have just asserted that this is the Ridge encampment because it's up on the Ridge, and there's not any others that are. So this is along Chittata Creek here, and so I just, put these little hatchers in so you could see, you know, where I'm talking about. There's a big spring right there. That's that spring that shows up. There it is. There's a view of that spring. So some camps on this side of the hill, some camps on this hilltop, camps up here. We don't know how many people there are. When you look at this and you're like, oh, there's a few tents up there. There's hundreds and hundreds of people at that location. That's what's being represented by those symbols. I should look and see how I'm doing for time. I'm running you guys into the ground, I'm sorry. So we go out and, and our, our first rule is do no harm, okay? Not like your doctor. Um, <laughs> you say, I'm, I'm a doctor, but I'm a talking doctor, not a cutting doctor. <laughs> and so we take a two-pronged approach. We do, we go on these likely camp location. When you got a map, you know you're pretty close. And we do remote sensing. So we used magnetometry, which measures differential soil magnetism. So for instance, if somebody had campfires there for a long time, that changes the soil magnetism. You can identify the locations of those hearths, as you would expect in a, in a camp that goes on for 70 days. Um, of course, it's 105 degrees, you know, you're probably not burning much. Um, and it will also, in some cases, identify intrusions into the subsoil. So one thing that uh, I don't really like to talk about is the most likely intrusions into the subsoil out there are graves. Because if Buttrick was right, there's anywhere from 700 to 1,500 people buried out there somewhere. We don't want to intrude upon those in any sense, but I think we want to identify them, to find them, to honor where they are, and then not disturb them. You have to know where they are to not disturb them. So that was a sort of a subtext of what we were doing. The second thing we did, and here's some of my students working away at it, is we did uh, metal detection surveys. Now, I didn't expect there to be very much around these camps, you know, a button or two falls off, a little bit of tack, that sort of thing, because folks aren't there that long, and they don't have much stuff they're taking away from their homes with nothing, what's on their backs, what they could put in a packing basket and carry off. So I, we don't expect there to be a lot out there, um, but we just need one or two objects to say, that's what this is, we found it. So we have to find diagnostic material, stuff we can say, this dates to at least the late 1830s. And then we know they were on one of those camps. Well, we worked our hearts out here on the, on the Ridge Camp, 
beautiful location in May, that's in May, and you could not get a shovel in the ground to save your life. We broke boots, we broke shovels, everything else. Kids were jumping up and down on their shovels just to dig that far down to find what turned out to be uh, beer cans, <laughs> pull tabs, you know, modern chain, stuff like that. What we did see as we did that is there's no way that if people had folks they needed to bury, they couldn't have buried them up there in June and July of 1838 because that drought was so bad the trees were dying. So they had to have taken these people somewhere else to bury them to the, to the low grounds. And indeed, uh, Daniel Buttrick saw, he mentions every time he comes into the agency of seeing this family carrying a body somewhere or this family carrying a body somewhere. So they're not up around these camps and we wouldn't expect them to be in, in those camps. I mean, you don't keep death with you. You know, it's moved away. So that was one lesson we learned there. The other lesson we learned as we walked back and forth across this field with these magnetometers and trying to dig was, there was nothing there. We worked our hearts out and we couldn't figure out why we weren't finding anything. Here is a plot, a magnetic plot. Those are actually old plow furrows up there. Okay, that's part of a tin building that fell down right in there. This is geologic features here. There's nothing cultural in there that we could identify. The reason being is this hilltop was intensively farmed for cotton in the latter half of the 19th and first half of the 20th century. And all the dirt that had everything that everybody laid down there in June and July and August of 1838, it all slid down the hill. It washed off. That stuff moved maybe hundreds of feet. You can see all those little dots, those are all the metal artifacts that we found and they were all 22 cartridges and shotgun shells and everything else. Nothing from the 1830s. Even though we knew definitively everything on that site matched up. We even found the old roadbed that fed into it. We were right on it and there was nothing. I was like, we got our, or, you know, our work's cut out for us here because there's very little left on these places. Third try, third try. We go out to some other camps. Um, these are the Chittata Creek camps. That's the mouth of Chittata Creek there. And begin our work here. And see, there's, there's the old road that shows up on the map. That was the road that ran from the Cherokee Agency down to Spring Place, went to McNair's, down to Spring Place. And everyone thought it was this modern road right here. You know, that that road is perpetuated on the landscape. Well, we spend a lot of hours out there, Chet Walker and I, and here he is running a, a ground penetrating radar across this field. He produces this map uh, showing differential magnetism across nine hectares. Now, if you're not used to thinking in hectares, think about 15 acres. We covered about 15 acres out there. That's incredible coverage, and I've got to, to give uh, Great thanks to Chet for doing this. And you can see it just looks, it looks like a mess, right? But a mess is what you want to see. A mess means there's something going on out there magnetically. And the thing I want to draw your attention to, is you see there's this, there's this weird, linear, vague disturbance across this field here. And right through there. And then when you see these dots and they're black and white on the side, that's a piece of iron. Okay, that's a dipole signature. That's a bunch of trash right there. Well, you know, first we started up along this road thinking, ah, oh, the camps are right here. They weren't. Uh, I dug up a lot of barbed wire there, but not anything like that. But that right there, turning up that, there's a close-up view of our coverage. That's the old road. You can't see it anymore. It got plowed over, it got buried in the field, washed in and filled, but you can see it magnetically out there. And I'd wondered why, when I was working out across here, I was finding not anything here, but I started finding later stuff, but from the 1860s, out along the middle of the field there. It turned out because that road was still in operation through much of the 
much of the 19th century, that then gave us our key where to look for the camps. And sure enough, when we got on the other side of the road, we started finding artifacts that date absolutely to the period. Not only that, that we can absolutely associate with Cherokee immigrants. So for instance, these scissors, we found in two different locations identical scissors. These are little embroidery scissors. These were sold, cheap scissors sold by the sutlers at Fort Cass at the agency. Sold for that money that people were trying so hard to get away from the Indians. This, that's what people bought and they broke immediately and they threw them away. Um, that's a piece of a brass trigger guard of a rifle. Because folks, some folks did have their guns still. You'd think you'd, they would take all the guns away, but they didn't. Some folks had those. This is a brass kettle that's been chopped in parts of that brass used for something else. You see these all the time on 19th century Cherokee domestic sites where people recycle brass to use it. Objects like, there's a Dutch oven. There was blown up cast ironware everywhere. These people were, uh, you know, the army brought out kettles and Dutch ovens and things for folks to use because they hadn't been able to bring them from home. It's cheap cast iron. They got the, you know, the uh, lowest bid on it. It's cheap cast iron and it blew up on people. And so that's one of the things you find on these camps. That's a flattened rifle ball, hammered out flat, um, cut nail, brass hasp. So there is material and actually pretty appreciable material signatures from the late 1830s on these camps. So what we were able to do in the course of the, you know, what I've shown you is we were able to demonstrate that using this methodology, using remote sensing and comprehensive systematic metal detection, that we are indeed able to identify these camps that were the very center of the sort of the stall in the immigration and removal of 1838. I mean, this is this is the epicenter. This is the place where um, I know I sound a little maybe I sound a little bit excited now. I came home. I got home in the evening. It was a three-hour drive back home after finding this and mapping it. And I'd call my wife and I said, we found it. We got home and she said, how's that make you feel? How's that make you feel? You glad you found it? She expected me to be elated because I'd been, I mean it was 15 degrees out there in March when we were doing this. And I said, I can't really express to you how sad I feel. Because I, across a distance of 180 years, I'd reached out and I'd touched the suffering of these people. And they touched me with that. Even though these things were mute, what I saw, you know, I'd been looking for, I've worked in, in Cherokee archaeology since I was little, no, not quite, but since I had hair. Um, <laughs> and have a lot of friends. I have a lot of friends in the Eastern Band and Cherokee Nation and UKB. When I found this, have you ever, have you ever experienced a thing where you find out months after a friend has died that, you know, it's not that immediate grief of that moment when someone's died, but you find out months later, it's telegraphed to you. I told my wife, that's how I feel when I see this. This is an incredibly powerful place and an incredibly powerful landscape that documents not only the travails of the Cherokee people, but it's a jumping off point from which we then see the resiliency and the resurgence of the Cherokee people in the years that would follow. This event did not define the Cherokee people just was a notch in their history. It was a thing that people need to always remember, but it did not define the Cherokee people as the Trail of Tears people or the Removed people or anything else. People rose back up after this. 
but there was an immense amount of pain and suffering that was caused by Jake Skeeney and everybody else, by Jackson and all of his cronies and everybody who was brought in there. And what did it net us? Nothing. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, for the every every single thing I've shown you is oriented north as it was shown either on contemporary maps or as it was shown on the Fort Cass map. The Fort Cass map though deviates that because of declination that has happened thereafter. So the Fort Cass map is actually rotated about 10 degrees from what our current map is. Yeah, yeah, it is. So here's one of those camp locations. And so we've seen, as I've already said, that, that this works. This enables us to locate these things, to document them, and we hope, we hope to preserve this so everybody will have some place they can walk to and be a little closer to this story, have a little bit more understanding about what went on have a little bit of the feeling that I had when I found that. So thank you, and I'm happy to... I'm happy to visit with you and take questions. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am? You see grass. I said, wasn't it rocky? It, 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 was, it, was, very, it was very rocky. Um, probably when people were out there, it wasn't covered in buttercups or wasn't covered with buttercups very long. It didn't take very long for them to walk all of the, all of the grass and everything off of that. And remember, it was hot and dry. It was very hot and dry at that time. Some of them had cattle and stuff as well. Did they not? Well, a lot of folks had cattle, but they, they couldn't bring them there. I'll, I'll tell you one other little story, because I should shut up, but one, one story that affects me is there was, there was a man who lived uh, on the Hiawassee River up near the foot of the mountain there. His name was Poor Bear. And Poor Bear filed a claim against the federal government. These claims started in 1838 and go right on through 1833 where people are filing for compensation. What Poor Bear claimed was that the soldiers killed his pet bear. He had a pet bear. It had a collar and it had a chain. And when the soldiers began to take the family away, the bear broke loose and followed them because Yonah was not going to be left behind. And he followed them and the soldiers didn't know what to do, so they turned around and they shot the bear. And so all, all that poor bear could claim for money was the value of a bear skin and the value of a collar and the value of a chain. And so little stories like that to understand how this affected individuals and affected families that I think are really, really powerful there. Yeah. Well, burial sites <sighs> They're really difficult to find on purpose. What I hope is that we can identify these places and protect them. You know, uh, that's, that's always iffy. Not necessarily mark them, but make sure they're safe. Make sure they're protected. There, this, is a, this is a haunted landscape. Uh, not that you're going to walk out there and see somebody in a sheet. But you can feel it when you're in this place. You can feel uh, the pain that was there. So. Thank you. Thank you.